becoming more and more aware of fucking hell. Is that on film too? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm Ryan. I'm Jim. And welcome to the Concept Crucible podcast. So today we're going to have a little bit of a fun cast. We're going to be talking about how and why we chose philosophy and why we chose to go to UW. Um, it just, I don't know, sometimes when I reflect back on my life and the choices that I made and how I ended up where I am now, it's kind of yeah. funny where you can pinpoint it to like one one crucial decision that sets you off down on, on a, a particular path. Yep. And uh, we need to do something silly and irrelevant or irrelevant, irreverent. And so we should probably just have some fun and talk about our own personal stories for this cast. Yeah. So do, I'm going to put it in context, context. Ryan and I both have master's degrees in philosophy from the yeah. University of Waterloo, which yeah. is my hometown. And, yeah. and my adopted town, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so we did both our undergraduate and graduate degrees there. Mm -hmm. We have no experience of what it's like to attend a different university oh. beyond stories that I've heard from other people. Yeah, or just visiting. Yeah. I've heard that in America the universities don't have bars. That is weird to me. Does They really don't? Drinking age is 21. Yeah, yeah I guess that makes sense. Hmm. I never thought about that. Yeah, our university has like five. <laughs> <laughs> that, I feel, sums up life at UW. Yeah. In a nutshell, yeah. even as a person who doesn't drink. Yeah. A lot of good times spent in those establishments. And some bad. Mostly good. Mostly good. <laughs> What's your favorite bar on campus? Uh, Grad House. Yeah. Because it has, I, I, as a non-drinker, hmm. the Grad House has the best food and the least antics. Um, yeah. The bomber has uh, has has the best, um, like they they're, they've always got shows going on, really cool stuff there. Yeah. Um, but usually, what I am looking for is a quiet evening, and that the grad house is where I get it. Yeah, yeah. You f you tend to have, on average, better conversations at grad house. I mean, I've had a lot of good conversations at bomber with friends, but we went there specifically, like we didn't meet <laughs> up randomly with friends there, so we went there for a place. Yeah. And, so, but Grad House is good times, good times. Anyway, I think you should tell your story first. All right, so um, when I was in high school, um, I originally intended on becoming an engineer and uh, was puttering along all right. And then after grade 10 math, uh, in grade 10, I was put into the advanced mathematics course. And I fell behind because the advanced mathematics was more self-directed learning. And so I didn't do the work. There was no teacher there to check homework, so I didn't do the homework. And I fell behind. So when I hit grade 11, I was behind for math. Um, and then in physics and chemistry, uh, I did well in grade 11 for both. And then in grade 12, I started to slip on some of the more difficult mathematics uh, but I, I enjoyed certain certain topics like optics. Loved optics. I always thought that was interesting, and it was easy easy for me to catch on. But I watched my my math and physics and chemistry marks start to slide, and I realized that um, maybe engineering is not for me. Because also at the time I was intending on going to the Royal Military College, um, and I figured that'd be a good bet. Engineer in the military. Which, As opposed to philosopher in the military? Yeah, well, we're not there yet. Um, yes, I know clearly I don't look like I'd be a, a good soldier. I'd probably be good in, like, Siberia. I'd yeah, be able you to look survive. pretty imposing on the ca on the camera. Yeah, but I'm sure I don't have the soldier's physique. I have a hibernation physique that I carry all year long. But anyway, so, uh, so then I'm like, okay, well, this engineering thing's not going to work. Um, but then right around grade 11... I started to get more interested in English. Um, maybe it's just I had a good teacher or the curriculum got better, but I started to take a little bit more of an interest. And then in grade 12, uh, I had a teacher, Mr. Steffler, head of the English department, and I took his writer's craft course. And I just absolutely excelled in there. I, I loved it. Um, I fell in love with the material. He introduced me to a lot of really interesting literature um, got me reading more poetry, um, and his his style was, I don't know if he was necessarily influenced by the Hollywood teachers, like in uh, Dead Poets Society with Robin Williams's character, but he he 
was a lot like that. He would walk into a class silently, like not say anything to us, write a poem on the chalkboard, turn around and tell us to respond to it. And then we had 10 minutes to respond to the poem in any way we wanted to short story, write our own poem, analyze it, whatever. And then he would have a few of us volunteer to read it back. Then we'd hand it in. And then either later on that class or the next class, he would hand it back to us with his comments on it. Not so much a grade. I don't. He he graded reluctantly. He hated the the idea of the grading in the in the school system. But um, but he would respond to it. You know, be like good use of imagery, or I have no idea where you're going with this, or tell me more. You know, like really trying to prod it out and develop us as writers. So I absolutely loved that class. And so for a little bit, I considered going to RMC for English. And then I'm like, well, I don't see the point in taking English in the military. Um, because I would much rather be you know, a soldier rather than administrator. So I'm like, well, why go to RMC? Why don't I take English somewhere else? But then I started to reflect a little bit. And I'm like, well, it's, not really, it's not really English I like. It's, it's tackling the concepts. It's... Analyzing the poetry for interesting use of language, and then uh, honing in on that one. Uh, uh, Homing. Honing? Homing. Homing. Homing in on it. Honing my skills. Homing in on the idea. (laughs) Um, So then I thought, okay, well, maybe it's not English that I like. Maybe it's something else. And then it came time to apply to university, because that's what we did. That was what was expected of me. Even though um, I would be the first huckle in the family to go on to post-secondary and I'd be uh the first after my mother actually I was the first to go to university because my mom did college um she, for nursing um so it was expected of me to apply to post-secondary and and I'm looking through the the course catalogs of the different schools and I'm like oh philosophy I think that's what that, that I think that's what I like about what I'm doing in English Meanwhile, the only exposure to philosophy I ever had that I was consciously aware of was the Bill and Ted movie. Uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure when they pick up Socrates from, from ancient Greece. So so Socrates so Johnson. You know, and they read out the, the quote from the text. The only true wisdom worth knowing is that you know nothing. And then Ted's like, that's us, dude. That's really the, the limited experience that I had to philosophy. But it sounded like what I wanted to do. And and so I was applying off to philosophy programs. And the only reason why I went to UW is because Mr. Steffler, who I looked up to, and I, in some sense I wanted to be like him, he went to UW. And, uh, you know, I, I, even during class he was talked about maybe going back and finishing a master's degree dealing with um, hypertextuality in literature. The, the idea of being able to just click through literature and, go, and like, dive deeper through, through, through the literature and hypertexting. So... Uh, I don't know if he is going to do it, but it's something that he talked about and it seemed interesting and cool to me. So, And when I came into first year, as you know, at UW, you're not a first year psychology student. You're not a first year anything. It's when you're in arts. You are a maggot. You are. You are. <laughs> no, no, but Wait, you, sorry. You enter UW as a first year arts student, but I always introduce myself as a first year philosophy student. I always get confused between first year and full metal jacket. Yeah, it happens. Um So that's how I got to UW, and that's how I chose philosophy. And thankfully, I took James Van Evera's intro philosophy, so Philosophy 100, and I took uh, Zunich's Critical Thinking 145. Those were the two philosophy courses that I, the first ones that I took in first year, first term. And luckily, it clicked and it worked and it kept me interested and I I kept going with it. Because who knows, if I had a bad first uh, encounter with it i might have changed my mind into something else or dropped out of school who knows you probably wouldn't be sitting here i I probably would not be sitting here i i probably would not have known you um but so it turned out well the um experience paid off and i went all the way through undergrad and then decided i wasn't ready for the real world so i decided to do my university version of a victory lap which was which was grad school. <laughs> that was quite a lap. It was quite. A, it took three three times to finish that lap. In high school, I managed to do it in one year. So at the very least, it was, it was good to go there. So, uh, so that's that's my story of how and why for philosophy. That that that's kind of involved. My mine is a lot simpler. Uh, the power supply on my computer died. That was no like, like when when you when you talked earlier about, about boiling it down to a single event or a single decision. Mm-hmm. The power supply on my computer died. As a result, 
I couldn't. I didn't get paid for another week, and so I couldn't get a new one mm-hmm. for another week. As a result, I went book shopping with uh, Big Dan and bought a bunch of books. Some of which are on these shelves. All of which actually are on these shelves somewhere. Mm-hmm. But uh, it included everything. Like uh, a copy of Tom Jones from 1950, a book on democratic theory by a prophet U of T, um, a biography on Henry Luce, the guy who founded Time magazine, and my very first philosophy book, apart from the tiny bits of, of uh, Socrates and Plato that I had read before, uh, which was Immanuel Kant's Foundations of a Metaphysics of Morals. Uh, which is not the easiest book to get into. And I, I read it. It was very thin, though. Mm. And I read it. And I won't, I will, I cannot admit to understanding it. I, I still, I've read it probably seven times since then. And I still, I have a handle on it, but it's not, you know, what you'd call solid. It's very dense. It's not a very good foundation. But very thin. No, it, it, it is a pretty good foundation. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean uh, your foundation in it is not very stable. Yeah, well, I mean, I was like 19, and and I but I read it, and I had a, I had a lot of questions, and I spent a lot of time. I, work, I was working in a library, and I spent a lot of time uh, trying to figure out problems with philosophy and problems with the world. I was really trying to figure out problems with myself and, mm-hmm. and figure out my own shit. I was, a, I was a 19-year-old who had been thrown out of high school three times. And could barely envision myself having any future. Uh, And then I realized at that point, after spending years reading other philosophy books, that, hey, that was a thing that I I loved doing um, because it was sort of the essential bits about thinking about stuff. And not just thinking about stuff, which is the sort of pop definition of philosophy but thinking thinking about it well and thinking about it in a way that meant understanding it and understanding things was the key to getting stuff done Mm -hmm. now i realize that getting stuff done is the key to getting stuff done (laughs) i can i can understand my way through an entire afternoon and not accomplish a thing but yeah so i i i spent the next three or four years saving my pennies um, and I got my my GED, and I, uh, which is a weird experience, but it's an overnight thing. I, I, I remember I couldn't afford a hotel, so I, I, I had to choose between a bus ticket to, to London to take it or a motel. So I picked the bus ticket because otherwise it wasn't going to happen at all. And I spent the night in a park reading Moby Dick, <laughs> which much better read by the way, than Foundations on Metaphysics and Morals. Much better. Call me Ishmael. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, and I saved my, script and saved my pennies, and I, went to, and, I, and I went to university. And my original philosophy for it was PhD or bust. Mm-hmm. And happily, I changed that philosophy in, like, fourth year because I realized I didn't actually want to be a university professor. Um, there are a lot of things about it that I really enjoy, but mm-hmm. there are a lot more things about it that I do not. Uh, and I, I had the virtue of working with, uh, in in my in my masters, I had the virtue of working with someone who is going to who is destined to be a university professor, Jesse Wright, mm-hmm. um, who is doing his PhD at Western right now, and I got to see exactly what someone who is going to to get a phd and be successful is like Mm. and how different that is from who i am and what i would like to do but yeah i mean mean, it's for me it started with questions about ethics and and questions about morality and and from there moved into sort of metaphysics and epistemology and how we know what the right thing is and we'll we'll do our ethics episodes later that's that's we're gonna f- cap off the season with the two part virtue ethics throwdown. <laughs> I've just decided. I think we've 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 hinted at it before, but that's the, the the essential thing for me is that that it was it was always something. the The way I always explain it to people when I was talking to undergrads is it isn't a thing that you do or study because you want to. It is a thing that you study because you have to for years i was i was you know staying up until three in the morning reading aristotle and then getting up at seven and still thinking about the stuff that i had been reading about the night before 
and you know it, it sort of infects everything that you do and not just in that jerky second year philosophy student explain how everything relates to to, to plato no. way but in general it, it 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 tends to infect your entire life yeah. i would i would talk with undergrads and they would they would say things like well I, i'm not sure if i really want to major in philosophy I'm like if you have to ask the answer is no you don't want to major in philosophy maybe you want to minor in it maybe you like make, i mean maybe you're just interested in it maybe you just want to take a couple courses and see but you'll know when you when you're going to major in it you will know and you'll be like wow now I need to take this thing. Yeah. And I need to spend hours and hours reading the words of dead Frenchmen because it's going to help me figure out stuff about now. Or even worse, I have to learn French in order to <laughs> read. That's not, that's not worse. <laughs> Let me tell you, I, 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 I didn't learn French to read Descartes, but I did learn Greek to read Marcus Aurelius. And Marcus Aurelius in the original Greek is pretty cool. God, I feel like such a philosophy snob. But I guess the, the the real question is 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 why? I mean, I mean, I mean, for you, it's a question of interest. For me, it's a question of insanity, mm-hmm. maybe. But there's there's probably some kind of common ground. I mean, for me, it's it was and still probably is the key to understanding not just how the world works and and what the world is like. Um, but how I work and how I should work. I mean, much like my library, my, my study of philosophy is entirely about myself. Mm-hmm. I am, I, maybe I am a huge narcissist. But, it, you know, it, it's, it's about me and, and figuring out how I work and figuring out how I should. Mm-hmm. And from there, maybe possibly understanding how, how other people should or how other things should work. For me... There's, I feel like there's a combination of two things. Um, even though, even though I tend to argue a lot, and people accuse me of, I, you know, you just always have to be right. My standard response to that is, well, who honestly wants to actively be wrong? Like, I sometimes do. Be wrong. I sometimes wish I didn't know. Like the more I know, the sadder I get about things in the world. <laughs> the de- um, <laughs> your philosophy degree comes with a double helping of existential dread. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I've I always like knowing I like and this is actually going to tie in with a future episode when it comes to skills I like knowing how to do things and I mean I, I, I enjoy researching and learning how to do new things but I like you know knowing the answer or applying knowledge you know so it's like okay uh, here's something a, a current problem that I have I like to take a previous idea that I have and then it, you know, see how it fits into this this problem. You know, and making connections where they weren't um, readily apparent before. I really enjoy doing that. I'm not sure that that's the study of philosophy so much as being smart. No, but here's the other side of philosophy, uh, or here's the other side of it that, I, that philosophy for like for me, which again you could probably say that uh, uh, literature does this, or or any other you know erudite a bit of knowledge or a specific domain of knowledge philosophy allowed me to sample a lot of different interesting ideas and i often think of ideas like how wine snobs consume wine that you take it in a little bit and you let it roll around the tongue and you taste it and you see how it affects you know this side of the tongue or the you know like and then and then you spit it out and then you kind of contemplate on it like okay how does it fit together and you know sometimes i think of ideas like that just you, you take an idea in and you like let it just roll around a little bit and see how it fits and see what you think about it spit it out or or cut it open and examine it, and I know it's very brutal in that regard. But I mean, you can't really cut open wine. But <laughs> this but, is the the deep dark secret of the Concept Crucible podcast. Yeah. I am a huge narcissist, and Ryan is Hannibal is is an idea cannibal. Yeah, a snobby idea cannibal yeah. at that. So. Uh, but philosophy allowed me to do that. Philosophy exposed me to a lot of different ideas. And not only did philosophy do that, but the people I encountered, uh, I, I'd say, have at least equal share in that mm-hmm. of exposing me to new ideas, new modes of thinking, new vantage points of which to see things that I hadn't seen before. Um, you know, you tend to privilege your experience, but then 
you know, once you're open to new new avenues of looking at things, it allows you a greater perspective, a little bit more of an Archimedean view from from far outside the system, if possible. Um, so that's for me. Philosophy really did that. I think. I think to to sort of think about what you're what you're getting at is is in a lot of other disciplines, you are you are shown the right way to do stuff. Well, you're told how to think. Well, I mean, I don't know that that's true. So, I mean, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even say that that holds true for math, like things like math or engineering or science. But even in, in, in certainly in art or literature, those especially don't hold true. But the 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 interesting thing about, uh, and I don't, I don't think philosophy is the only subject that does this, but it is the only, I, I think, the only subject because it deals with, I, I, it deals with ethics, and I, mm-hmm. I work. Most of my work is in ethics, and most of your a lot of your work is also in ethics. Mm-hmm. And it's not just here is the right way to do things; it's here are ten different right ways to do things, or at the very least, here are ten like, different non wrong ways. To yeah, do like that. like like, but here he like here are here are you know eight to ten examples of the right of of really really strong arguments. For the right thing to do in a, in 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 a situation or in any situation, mm-hmm. and they are in conflict. Mm-hmm. So it and 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 it becomes a question not just of well, which one is the right one, but is there a right one? Mm-hmm. And it, and and it, and it, it like it, you have to engage in sort of pulling apart the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And I think you, I think you also do that in math. You also do that in engineering and, and 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 that kind of thing. I mean, if not with with theorems, then in the very least in in practice, mm-hmm. you have to sort of. I, I mean, that's that's part of what understanding a theory is. Mm-hmm. But it a it doesn't start from from year one, no. and I think it's it's not done as explicitly. And so you spend a lot. Of, I mean, I mean, I got into philosophy because I spent a lot of time thinking about ethics and why I did things and, and 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 why people did things the way that they do and whether they should or not. I, I actually, for years, I went, every year I would go around to a bunch of churches and ask them ethics questions. And uh, it, was, it wound up being a, a thing I didn't really enjoy, and so I stopped doing it. Um, but, but it was because I regarded them as sort of the keeper of their flock's um, moral well-being. And this is, of course, not actually how church works but i was 19 got mm. me some slack mm. but you know there there's it's it's very explicit like like and 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 it's examples that come up sort of every day we should really do an episode on thought experiment experiments mm-hmm. but i mean where where you can you can offer an argument that something is the right thing to do and it isn't a question of of you know, there only being one one right thing. You know, so often there are there is more than one right thing, or but, at least there, there's more than one permissible thing. Yeah, but yeah. the the just the the justification is sort of what matters. I mean, we yeah. have harped back and forth on the fact that you are a, a diehard virtue ethicist, and you will only do things because you are copying your betters. Yeah. Uh, whereas I endorse a sort of stakeholder wishy-washy best practice where i want everyone to look out for everyone else um and these are very different ways of doing things but they result in us doing almost the same things and we can embrace two entirely different moralities while and and still be friends yeah (laughs) you know part of part of grad school in philosophy is realizing there's more important things than philosophy yeah like books and that's, that's why we're friends is books <laughs> our libraries yeah see our library episode which is on uh on ryan's face i just realized i think i'm sitting on the in the wrong chair right i now. i i just realized that too yeah. i think we switched sides Normally this is amazing it's you. revolutionary if you're listening to this show nothing has changed but we have just realized that something has changed normally the annotation would be on the other side of the screen i just realized ah well i'll uh, i have to set up a whole new animation now oh uh, sorry but everything is your fault but re- re- so I got a concussion, I reflecting think. on it, the, I mean, the real question isn't 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 why would you study philosophy? Um, the the question, I guess, is sort of 
knowing what you know now, like to sort of bring it all back in, would you do it again? Not would you, you know, like time wise or anything like that, but I mean. Don't take my hesitation to say that I'm unsure. I'm just trying to think of a reason why I wouldn't because... It did help pay for our microphone. It did help pay for our microphone. Thank you to the UW Philosophy Department. I have to say, no, I probably wouldn't change it. Even knowing what I know now, I don't think it would necessarily change anything because... um, If... Okay, if you were to... um, compare say my current wage potential to something that perhaps is more lucrative sure maybe there's an argument to be made there that had i stuck to engineering or had i been able to bootstrap myself up in mathematics or whatever and be able to to do it um maybe there's something to be said about that but that doesn't necessarily convince me that that would have been a better option for me um because even though i came out of school knowing that I knew less than perhaps I thought I knew going into it. Mm-hmm. You know, the, bur- the burden of learning more is you realize you know less. Um, it'll, it, it helped to correct a lot of poor thinking on my part. Um, it exposed me to a lot of interesting things that I carry forward in my life. Like, I didn't realize I was a virtue ethicist really until we started podcasting. <laughs> But it's true. It, your, it, your allegiance to Aristotle is well known, <laughs> sir. I read the, Nicoma- the Nicomachean Ethics during my lunch breaks when I worked in the factory one time, and my coworkers ripped me for it. They're like, "What the hell are you reading?" And, uh, so I Little trying. did you realize it would be the way you would choose to run and the that, rest of your it life. Was, it was my Bible. Um, so yeah, I don't think I don't think I change it. You know, if anything. I would just do it a little bit more intelligently and try to perhaps increase my my earning potential or try to trick myself into liking it enough to go want to do my PhD. <laughs> Honestly, my idealized version of the good life would be teaching intro Plato at, at a college somewhere. That is highly idealized. That's it's highly idealized. Just just exposing people to to. Plato's ideas as a starting point, not that it's the right point, just as an interesting starting point um, and going from there um, and just getting people thinking about the ideas. And maybe some people would be interested in, in studying philosophy after that. Some people would be like, no, I'm definitely never doing that again. But as, as someone who has worked in academic support, that is highly idealized. Um, so that was that was also my vision um, when I first started. And then I I realized all the other sort of things that go along with being a professional academic and how many of them I wasn't as passionate about as I was other other things. Departmental meetings! No, actually, I really (laughs) enjoy departmental meetings. (laughs) Um, I really, I don't as much enjoy uh, the uncertainty in applying for grants. Mm, I don't, I don't enjoy the big actually the big thing that, that that got me out of it was i don't enjoy not collaborating philosophy is it tends to be a, a, a discipline of lone wolves mm-hmm. as opposed to something like psychology where you do experiments with groups and you you publish papers with people and you do research projects together philosophy is really sort of you know in in a, in a lot of areas of it especially the areas i was in is it's it's all individuals and I really like working with people as part of teams and part of groups because that's what helps me work better. Mm-hmm. And I have more fun and I enjoy myself more. Uh, and that's what matters to me. And so I wind up sort of drifting away from it into fields where I can be more collaborative. Mm. But, yeah, if I, 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 I could not not do it. I think that I would be a very different person without it. And I don't think that I would like the person that I, that I would have become without sort of going to university and studying philosophy. Like if if I had taken lit or classical studies or, or something, I think that I would not have been as happy Mm -hmm. um, or as fulfilled as, as taking philosophy and, and not just, not just studying it, but applying that study to sort of every, I mean, that's the thing is, is once you start doing it, you, you, you have a really hard time stopping. Mm-hmm. And that is the cool thing for me. Mm-hmm. But 
it is also the the sort of tricky thing because it doesn't just it isn't just a thing that you pick up and put down Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a thing that infects your life and that you wind up doing every day or when you don't do it you notice and you regret it Mm -hmm. (laughs) i have those moments you know where where I, i either i spend a lazy day or where i let something slide uh, whether it's 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 morally or you know otherwise, and I know, and I know exactly why I shouldn't have done it, mm-hmm. and I know, and now the challenge is figuring out how to how to correct it because if I don't correct it, then I will know exactly why I should have corrected it, mm-hmm. and that, and that's I think where the existential dread comes from. But I can think of no better way to live my life. No. Which may just be the poverty of my imagination. (laughs) I don't know. I I think that um, even outside of the academic life, just thinking about the decision to go and study philosophy, the people that I associate with now, um, the opportunities that I have now, the things that I have done since that decision, um, everything from having a cool job like working in the gambling lab to um, being on a campus first aid team, which led into my, my master's thesis. Um, hell, even even dating my girlfriend, right? Like it's, it, those are all things that are, are branches out of that decision to, to study philosophy and go to UW. But even on a personal level, like I remember what I was like. You heard it here first. Studying philosophy will help you meet ladies. Actually, you heard it from like Rousseau. But yeah, well, meet meet the ladies, meet the dudes, whoever you fancy. You can find somebody to that uh, will will definitely keep your keep your attention and keep you captivated. But I remember what I was like in high school and coming into school, and even dur- like during those formative years that we talked about before. Annotation above my face. Um, I remember what I was like in those formative years, and I'm not sure what kind of person I would be today in the same way that you're saying. I don't know what I would be like today had I not studied philosophy and had I not set myself down on this course. So, so. the UW Philosophy Department did not pay us to, to do this or to yeah. say anything. They they gave us some graduate some gifts for graduating that we used uh, to buy the microphone. Yeah. But uh, all they did was put us to work um, and make, make us work hard. No. Yeah. Well, uh, Expected us to work. Hard. Expected us to work hard. Sorry. That that yeah. That's yeah, we, that's. We probably fail our obligation to be studious. I did. I only sometimes did. Sometimes I was studious. I recall being studious sometimes on occasions. Last minute. Sometimes some of those occasions were indeed at the last minute, but. All the time. All the time. <laughs> anyway, I want to hear about your disciplines. And what your discipline is, and wh- I mean whether it's the thing you studied in university or the thing that you do now, and how it changes you and why you do it. So leave that in the comments. Tell us a story. I really love hearing about people. Mm-hmm. But and we're gonna wrap up for today. I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. We're signing off. Stay awesome. Uh, what I was gonna say is because I'm becoming more and more aware that this is a visual medium, I now have to check my hair because the last couple podcasts I've had these weird cowlicks sticking up in the back of my hair. <laughs>